and above and beyond that through the written word to encounter the living word our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ and hear what you want to say to us as your people in Jesus name we pray Amen please be seated back in uh, October 2010 more than 600 Philadelphia area singers circulated among the Saturday morning shoppers in the large Macy's store in downtown Philadelphia. Then at exactly noon, the organist at the mall began playing the opening bars of the Hallelujah Chorus from Handel's Messiah. Suddenly, the singers who were sprinkled throughout the store started singing in full voice. The event, which was called a random act of culture, was organized by members of the City Opera of Philadelphia, who were joined by choristers from 28 other musical organizations. And it seems to have started something of a trend. What are often called flash mob performances of various kinds have since become pretty popular and the appeal of viral videos on the internet has played a big part in that. But the Alleluia Chorus ones raise some interesting questions because they represent a very open presentation of a gospel message in a public setting that can often seem rather closed to that. Mutual tolerance is supposed to be among the most highly prized moral values in 21st century Canada, and rightly so. But there can be a big difference between inclusiveness in principle and in practice as the church has often discovered to its cost. The season of Epiphany <coughs> brings a special focus on this issue for when we explore its full meaning, what we find is a thoroughly inclusive, all-embracing gospel that offers good news for everyone who will embrace an exclusive commitment to Jesus Christ by following the example of the three Magi from our Gospel reading and focusing on a godly model of excellence. To understand the full meaning of Epiphany we need to recognize that the word originally comes from a Greek word meaning appearance. And the appearance in question is clearly what the Book of Common Prayer calls the manifestation, the appearance of Christ to the Gentiles. So this Sunday we remember the three Magi who were among the first Gentiles to see Jesus and greet him in Bethlehem. These wise men appear to have been astrologers and they may have been followers of the Zoroastrian religion. We know from Matthew chapter 2 that they have traveled from the east and although we can't trace their exact place of origin, their gifts of gold, incense and myrrh may have come from Babylonia or Persia in the area of modern day Iran or Iraq. There have been different attempts to date the timing of their visit by identifying the star which they follow. <coughs> An astronomer on CBC radio once linked it with what she called a convergence of Mars, Jupiter and Saturn in 7 BC. But the star may have been simply a miraculous phenomenon. Matthew 2 seems to indicate that the wise men 
arrive as much as 18 months after Jesus' birth, by which time he and his family are clearly living in a house, not a stable. It's difficult to see why else King Herod would order the execution of all boys under two in the Bethlehem area if he knew that Jesus was still an infant. The Magi are probably best remembered for their selfless giving to Jesus. But Epiphany also reminds us that this is the earliest sign in Christ's life on earth that he came for every kind of people. He was born for those of every race, colour, creed, gender or religious background. So this is truly a manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles. It's a living lesson of God's grace and mercy to us all and of the great good news that the Apostle Paul announces as the mystery of Christ in our reading from Ephesians chapter 3 that the Gentiles, and I quote, have become fellow heirs, members of the same body and sharers in the promise of Christ Jesus through the Gospel. But the wise men don't discover this easily, of course, nor do they do nothing once they have. In that sense, they also leave us a challenging example. According to our Gospel, after they are led to Bethlehem, their faith is amply rewarded. When they saw that the star had stopped, we read in verses 10 to 11, they were overwhelmed with joy. Then on entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts. But wherever they have ultimately come from, the Magi have clearly travelled miles and probably risked many dangers to worship Christ and bring him gifts. Two of the great lies of false spirituality are that growth can come without any cost and that when we're doing the right thing we won't face opposition. And as our Gospel reminds us, the story of the Magi confounds both, for they must also avoid the machinations of King Herod after he has learned of a potential new king to threaten his own position. It's only through a dream, we read in verse 12, that God intervenes to prevent the wise men from becoming Herod's informers and thus betraying Jesus' exact location. So through their pilgrimage to Jesus' birthplace, the Magi provide us with a vivid example that nothing of real value tends to come easily, even if it's ultimately a gift of grace. Whether on our individual journeys of faith or in our life together as a church, growth will meet obstacles and it will require perseverance. We can only be confident that we will achieve it when we focus on its true source in our relationship with Jesus Christ and we remain committed to him. And what does true commitment mean? Again, the Magi have much to teach us because they not only travel far and overcome much to meet him, they recognize Jesus for who he really is and they worship him. And they not only bow down before him, they bring him the very best that they have to offer. In other words, the wise men quite literally walk the talk for miles and miles. And they put their money where their mouths are in their rich and richly symbolic gifts of gold for a king, frankincense for a great high priest, and myrrh for a living saviour who will die and rise again for the salvation of the whole of humankind. 
So in the story of the wise man from Matthew 2, the inclusive generosity of God's grace and mercy to all is met by the exclusive devotion of those who hail Jesus as he really is. Through their inclusion in God's plan of salvation, the Magi show that Christ has truly come and that the Christian gospel is good news for everyone. There are simply no limits to God's grace and mercy. But while God meets us and God accepts us exactly where we are, God doesn't leave us there. Instead, God calls us to enter a similar pilgrimage of faith as the wise men, to make an unconditional commitment to Jesus and to give him the absolute best that we have to offer as we focus on his model of excellence. Just last Monday, we began a new year. And some of us may feel pretty positive about the future. But we all know that we'll experience bad as well as good in the months and years ahead. And as we live through such exciting but troubled times, the message of epiphany that Christ is there for everyone can be especially compelling. In the person of Jesus of Nazareth, God has been uniquely revealed to the whole world and God invites us to draw near through faith in Christ and to receive eternal life, hope, peace, joy and security, whatever may lie ahead for us. The big question is how we will respond. Some years ago, Stephen Shapiro published some interesting stats about New Year's resolutions from the Opinion Corporation of Princeton. They showed that no fewer than 45% of Americans usually set resolutions and only 38% never did. So what was the success rate? You may or may not be relieved to hear that 8% said they were always successful in achieving their resolutions, 19% that they did so every other year, 49% that they enjoyed rare success, and 24% that they never succeeded and they failed on every single resolution every year. Yet perhaps the most revealing numbers had to do with people's priorities. Because some 47% of the resolutions related to what we might call self-improvement. 38% to losing weight. 34% to financial progress. And 31% to better relationships. Education, weight, money, and relationships. You probably couldn't find a more typical list of concerns than that. The big question is how it stacks up against God's priorities. In another article, Ruth Schenk offered an alternative perspective from someone in a very different life situation from most of us. For 11 years, Mary Leonard had dealt with a rare inflammatory tissue disease called polymyositis that invades the muscles and for which there is no known cause or cure. Leonard's case turned deadly when the disease invaded her heart and in March of 2010, she was told by doctors that she had no more than 24 to 48 hours to live. Yet after 20 days in a hospice centre, another 51 in rehab and sometime at home, Mary was still alive. She'd also had time to reflect on the changes that take place when you learn that your time is short. 
I call myself an average Christian, Mary said. I don't know exactly why God has done this for me, but I do know that life looks different now. Then she offered five life lessons that she learned through her ordeal, and I quote, one, know that prayer is powerful. Two, mend fences now. Three, release the reins of life to Christ. Four, know that God is able, more than able. Five, put your focus on what really matters. Put your focus on what really matters. And the epiphany message of good news for everyone surely reminds us today that while the common or garden concerns for things like self or financial improvement or weight loss that so often feature in lists of New Year's resolutions may be important, they pale into insignificance when compared with God's Priorities. So as we look ahead to 2024, the obvious question is whether we will trust God for the future or prefer our own purposes to God's plan. To put this another way, will we follow the Magi's example of heartfelt and sacrificial commitment and devotion to Christ or will we opt for less demanding Options. The choice is up to us. But the consequences of what we choose will ultimately determine whether this is truly a positive and fruitful new year for us and for our communities or not. Let's bow our heads. <coughs> Loving God, we thank you for the example of the three wise men who went through so much, uh, gave so much, and in the process set a living example of what it means to put Jesus first and foremost in our lives. Lord, thank you that you welcome us wherever we come from. You meet us exactly where we are on our spiritual journeys but you don't leave us there you call us to move forward so this coming year Lord help us all to do that as individuals and as church communities and to grow in grace as we seek your priorities for the future which may or may not be our own in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.